we're living in the time of an ocean crisis and the biggest loss of biodiversity uh, to have ever been experienced since humanity has privileged enough to <laughs> be given uh, the opportunity to live on the earth. It feels like there's us and then and then there's the in another place there's nature which sustains us. Kind of lost that awareness of what ke actually keeps us healthy. Welcome to episode 20 of the Future is Beautiful podcast. It's Plastic Free July and we have the perfect interview today to help you understand how plastic is affecting us and our oceans and how you can reduce your plastic use. Thank you to our latest patron, Melissa Davey. If you would like to join her in supporting us to make this podcast, visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co forward slash community. We need your support so we can be listener funded and advertising free. We are trying out something next week called a Patronathon. It was an idea I had on a bus whilst in India earlier this year. We're going to do a two hour Facebook Live where we share and perform and encourage viewers to become patrons, kind of like comic relief. If you'd like to join us, tune in on Wednesday night. And if you're in London and want to come to the HQ for the evening, my flat in Hackney, then let me know. All the info is on our website. My guest today is my dear friend Joe Royal, who I met years ago through Leeds University Friends. Joe is a sea champion with nearly 20 years' experience spearheading global marine programs and trans-ocean sailing ventures. She founded Common Seas to deliver policies, systems and technologies that enhance the productivity and resilience of the ocean. Jo is internationally recognised as one of Europe's leading female ocean yacht skippers. She's one of the few sailors to have circumnavigated South Georgia in the Southern Ocean and through her extensive sailing experience, which has taken her as far north as Iceland and south as Antarctica, Jo has been able to witness firsthand the effects of global warming. Jo is passionate about inspiring businesses and individual responsibility to protect natural systems and firmly believes that we hold the tools to ensure a healthy planet for future generations. She co-designed and skippered the Plastiki, an expedition that showcased waste as a resource and the crisis of plastic marine pollution. The vessel was made with a closed loop design from 12,000 reused plastic drinks bottles. She also was a contributor to our book, The Future is Beautiful. In this interview, we discuss how Jo's childhood illness made her more determined, how connected to the ocean we are as humans, and how plastic is affecting our lives. I hope that you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to The Future is Beautiful, with me, your host, Amisha Gadiali. On this show, we explore the weave between politics, spirituality, creativity, and sustainability. Every one of us has ideas and personal experiences to share that can lead us to a brighter future. Despite the challenges we face as a global community or the pressures that we meet in our daily lives, when we stop and dare to dream, to ask ourselves the big questions and to share what we are already doing, we create the future that we wish to wake up for. That future is beautiful. I'm delighted today to be joined by skipper, activist, campaigner, Joe Royal. So nice to see you, Joe. Mm, thank you. It's exciting. <laughs> I want to start by asking you what your first memory is of the sea. Gosh. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, when you're thinking about your first memory because you see pictures in your parents' home and you wonder whether that's whether your first memory has been influenced by pictures that, that are around. But I remember being tumbled by a wave on Lanarkin Beach in South Devon and feeling like I was in a washing machine. I need to stand up in ankle deep water <laughs> um, <laughs> and realising the power of the ocean. And t so I think that was probably when I was like three. But I have a terrible memory, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. And... And the sea was a big part of your childhood. Yeah, so we lived in, we grew up in, in Preston and had quite a landlocked um, um, home there, home life there where we went to school. 
but actually before I was born my uh, parents had bought a place in Dartmouth in Devon and right by the the river so uh, mum and dad took us down the M6 and M5 for six hours most bank holiday weekends and all of our school holidays and we spent all the time on the water sailing and in dinghies and at quite a young age my dad had put us in a dinghy and leave us to kind of tackle the tide and, <laughs> <laughs> and my mum would be panicking and I could always see her with a pair of binoculars from the, <laughs> from the house my dad would be like oh they'll be fine at least they'll come back on the changing tide <laughs> so we were very much uh, given this big respect but also great confidence of working with the wind and the tide and our dinghies with no engines. <laughs> and when did you learn to sail? Was that just just bit by bit? Yeah, it was just bit by bit. My dad was very keen and uh, my mum was very not. And uh, so he used to, he had this Hurley 24, which is quite a, he is 24 foot plastic. I mean, it really is the definition of what you call a yogurt pot sailing boat. <laughs> and uh, 24 foot is not big and there's, you know, myself and my two brothers. I was probably like three when he had that. And uh, yeah, so before we were all, you know, toddlers. And my dad, I just remember my dad going, point the bait in the wind, Sue, as he was trying to put the sail up. She's like, I'm trying. And then the next minute, she like disappeared down below. And like, dad would be shouting back to the helm and she'd be down below reading the paper going, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> she never really, she's always tried her really, really hard to like it, but never really had the same passion as the rest of us mm -hmm. about it. And do your brothers, are they still keen? Yes, sailors? we're all really keen. Um, my little brother, Ed, he left school and then came to work with me on board and then spent, um, prepared a couple of my race boats with me and then went off and did his own career on the classic boats. And, uh, and yeah, Charlie, we all love sailing. Yeah. <laughs> and so for you, when you like left school and went, left uni, was it just obvious that you would work at sea? Yeah, well, I'd had quite um, a funny school life because I was, I was actually quite ill at school and had this type, period of time when I couldn't walk. So I'd been there, I was at, I did my GCSEs in the adolescence ward in there. Uh, Royal Preston Hospital, which was great fun with all the young girl adolescents and their different and our different ailments. <laughs> um, had yeah, so I'd had quite a bit of illness with my legs on and off, um, some autoimmune disease, and been on a Zimmer frame at Sixth Form College. So that was very obviously very stylish. <laughs> I was hanging out with the cool kids on my Zimmer frame. And, uh, and I think like sailing had always been this, you know, this thing that I was, I was actually naturally good at, probably because I'd been brought up in that environment. And uh, I could be out my boat and everything would just work and the sense of adventure and, and also that kind of, you know, being with the people that you'd gone to sea with, even for a day trip around the Start Bay, you know, that, that quality time when you're working a boat together and you're sitting in the cockpit drinking a cup of tea or trying to get a reef in too late. So there's that beautiful relationship between the people that you're with and the, and the nature around you and Mother Nature's forces. So, um, so yeah, so I went to, I fell in love with a boat builder when I was in my late teens wasn't going to go to university and my dad came down for a chat said are you sure that you don't think you'd like to keep the freedom of opportunities open by going to university and actually I thought it was a very good idea so I'd spent a summer sailing and then went to university knowing full well that I would get a degree and go back to sea. That's good you picked up some good friends along the yes, way. Yes my best we friends. Ended up meeting yes. as well. <laughs> no and it happened to be some of the best years obviously. I know, I know, it's amazing how we've, we all went to the university and my best friends there. When you, when you went through all of this illness and all this vulnerability when you were a teenager and, and that didn't stop you from wanting to then have a really active physical 
like life. Yeah, I know, it's funny, isn't it? And it's kind of interesting reflecting back because I don't really think about it that often, but just recently um, someone I'd seen somebody who, you know, who was around at that time in my life and they were asking me a lot about, wow, it's amazing that you like left that, like, like that whole illness behind and now it's a completely different person. And I don't know if like lots of people, I mean, we've all had, you know, hurdles and you know, challenges in life and it's interesting how a few years later it's kind of almost not you or it's you know just mm -hmm. kind of but I think that it's obviously given me a huge respect for good health and freedom and to seize opportunities and I think that that's kind of fueled a lot of my travels and then now feels maybe it feels a lot of kind of also having all those experiences gives you a kind of a lot of opportunity to give back maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. And is there anything that you remember that you you had to do or a perspective that you had to bring in order to actually to heal um, through that process? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I think that because, I mean, I don't know how much we need to talk about my childhood illness, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was very, I was in, I remember being in a lot of, um, I mean, I was in a lot of pain, obviously. Well, it was a very painful condition and it used to like flare up, but then calm down again. But then a, a lot of the pain was managed with um, like meditation and deep breath, <laughs> mm -hmm. thanks to my mom. Um, and then eventually like, I was pumped full of these drugs, which was not a good idea, you know, which well, I think it was like necessary at the time. I don't think there was an option. Eventually I came through whether it was age and also mindset and um, and just a real strong mental thought that actually I was going to get through this illness and that this illness wasn't going to beat me. I really think that that power of kind of belief in yourself is such a great healer, mm. I think. Do you? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've prolonged illnesses by like not being able to let go of them in my mind yeah and I've also healed things quickly by having a, a, a certain mindset yeah I mean it's not an exact science because some illness, illness they take as long as they take and and it, there's so many factors I don't it's not as kind of exactly. I wouldn't be as like crass to say yes you can heal anything because I think that there's it's more complicated than that but it definitely helps you yeah. can have a mindset that gives you a sort of determination and a respect and a compassion with yourself. Yeah, but you're right, you know, it doesn't work for everything, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the C, because, I mean, most people don't have a strong relationship with the C, even though it's such a big part of the planet. Yeah, it's kind of forgotten. It is uh, the biggest ecosystem with all of these creatures that are yet to be discovered and provides the ability for us to breathe fresh air and drink drinking our water. And for most people, it provides a primary source of protein um, in the fish, you know, and most people in places where they haven't got the luxury of walking down the supermarket aisle and deciding what protein they're gonna they're gonna consume. So it is this kind of out of mind and out of sight. And there's this great quote by Byron that man's ruin stops at the shore. But um, <laughs> not <anymore>. fortunately, <laughs> in our life, we realise that that's not that that's not uh, the case. But actually, we're living at an incredible, you know, it's, it's, we're just learning so much about what the ocean has to offer us. Um, some people say that the space is more, people, more people have visited the space, we know more about the, moon, the space than we do about the ocean, but actually I don't think that's true anymore. We have an incredible building body of science, science and absolutely wonderfully thoughtful and intellectual 
scientists focusing their whole life career on the ocean and every day we learn something new. Mm. And it's fascinating as well, like the percentage of how much of the world is the sea and also the percentage of water in us as humans. Yes. Yeah. And it's, you know, the same sort of percentage of salt in our blood as there is in the, is in the ocean. Oh, really? Wow. <clears throat> So, so that's why you say we're sea creatures. I know, I always say we're sea creatures and everyone thinks I'm very cheesy. But <laughs> and I don't think people really Not get cheesy. it. And I've had like, someone said, are you going to take, when I was working recently, this client said to me, why do you have this, we're all sea creatures? Don't you think it's a bit childish? <laughs> no, you just don't get it. We are all sea creatures. You know, we're connected to the sea through every drop of water we drink and air that we breathe. And, um, and you know... And also, like, the sea is a source of well-being for many of us, you know. Like, you know, when you... For me, I go down to the sea side, I take a glimpse of the sea, and all of a sudden, it's like, phew, everything is just mm. released. You don't even have to get in it. You don't even have to get in it, but when you do, it's even better. Yeah. But then also, you know, I spent time living in, uh, working in the Sundarban region in Bangladesh. And there the sea is not so much of a release because it's obviously associated with severe weather and <laughs> sea level rise. So it's quite culturally specific. But for many of us well, around where we live, the sea is a source of release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a place of release. It's a place of relaxation. Mm. a place of adventure like scuba diving sailing mm. these kind of interactions yeah but with that we kind of maybe miss the the real depth and understanding of what the sea is yeah although yes yeah, so, I mean I think we do although I think it's the most important thing is from so more and more and more of us to have good times by and on the water because I think that the more you connect with nature whether it's the sea or a forest or <laughs> then the more intrigued you will the more you'll learn about it and then hopefully the more you'll want to protect it mm. yeah. is that for you where it comes from spending so much time at sea mm. I mean, I would assume so. I mean, I went to sea, I spent maybe more than, well, I suppose, I don't know how long I spent working at sea, like over 10 years working at sea, maybe more like 15. And I don't think I'd really listened in my biology and geography classes, but it wasn't until I'd kind of worked at sea and, you know, skippered expeditions with scientists, and started to learn about, through them, about our relationship with the ocean and the significance of the ecosystem. And, and then also being in really remote places like the Antarctic Peninsula or a remote <clears throat> island and seeing kind of plastic and fishing gear and visiting islands where the Japanese had bought all the fishing rights from the local people. And I was like, hmm, wait a second, I think we're maybe not having a balanced relationship with our ocean. Mm -hmm. So if you can give us a kind of overview of where the imbalance is in our relationship with the sea. <clears throat> well, I was recently... Uh, Last week I was with um, the UN Special Envoy for the Ocean, Peter Thompson from Fiji, and he said something quite savouring. He said, uh, we're losing the battle with overfishing, pollution, coral reef bleaching, sea level rise, but at least we know that we've got a battle. <laughs> 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 I was like, actually, you know, he's... I don't really like this war analogy <laughs> mm -hmm. when you're when we're talking about activism. Some people, you know, we we you do send, tend to start to hear this narrative of <laughs> battles and wars with nature, and, and it's a war with ourselves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But um, yeah, we're extracting too many fish 
from all ecosystems without any good management or governance. And we're pumping in everything because the sea is at the bottom of the, the hill. So all of these nitrates and nutrients and plastic just rolling into the sea. One rubbish truck a minute worth of plastic is going into the ocean. And we've, I think it's 70% of our coral has dying or dead, <laughs> which is absolutely fundamental to the health of the ecosystem and the food web. Um, so the sea is warming, it's becoming more acidic. Uh, the plastic is on the surface and it's mid and deep ocean. It's been found in the deepest places. Uh, it's also been found to be degrading into very fine particles and dispersing and smothering coral reefs and attracting disease and spreading disease around coral reefs. So just shows like the interconnectedness of these issues. Mm -hmm. Like you have one element, you know, pollution, plastic going into the ocean, the fish eat it, fish stocks are <laughs> impacted, smothers the coral reef, coral reef sustains the fish. So, so the, yeah, we have, we're living in the time of an ocean crisis and the biggest loss of biodiversity uh, to have ever been experienced since humanity was privileged enough to <laughs> be given uh, the opportunity to live on the earth. So that's quite depressing and I'm sure you've spoken, to <laughs> yeah. you've you know, I've heard of your previous conversations that you've had which is a lot are based on um, on this imbalance that we have. And I think, you know, a lot of it is just being like this last, I think a lot of it is a lack of sense of community and community with each other and responsibility. And, and then also it feels like there's us and then, and then there's the, in another place, <laughs> space, bucket, there's, nature which sustains us and that's kind of not we've kind of lost that awareness of what ke actually keeps us healthy mm -hmm. yeah absolutely I mean the implications of everything you're talking about I mean I know that we do see very physical implications in certain parts of the world can you talk a bit about that? Um, well, I think that we see implications being a bit depressing. It's okay. <laughs> it, is, it is a bit depressing. It is a bit so, depressing. There's a lot of... I mean, I, I'm actually not depressed about it. Um, well, I don't think... Well, I am depressed about it when I think about it too much, but you just have to keep, like, focused on these little things that you can do to try and you know, leave less of a footprint. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, actually, surprisingly, the most harshest reality I've seen is um, spending some time in the Indian and Bangladeshi Sundavans, where Yeah, it's interesting that I'm using this example, but I think it was the most hard hitting and it was probably in 2011. So yeah, after I'd finished the plastiki um, and spent three months drifting across the Pacific and was desperate to just get a rucksack on and go and do something on land on my own <laughs> without five boys. Um, <laughs> And I'd studied um, for my master's, 
I'd, I'd read a lot about climate refugee migration and also the, the impact of women who are living in coastal communities and um, in, on the front lines of climate change. So I, I went and travelled through the Indian Sundarbans and then the Bangladeshi Sundarbans and actually doing, tell me if I'm going off track, but <laughs> doing... Um, There's no track. <laughs> but going to we're the... We're in the ocean. We're in the ocean. <laughs> Okay, we're in the doldrums. <laughs> We've got time. Um, but going to these two places was extremely sobering. Um, and obviously I went, the whole trip was like two months or something, so I haven't got as much experience, you know, deep depth of experience. Um, but lots of insights. Um, obviously, the plastic waste and no waste infrastructure. Um <laughs> Bangladesh had banned the plastic bag, but it was absolutely, the plastic bag was absolutely everywhere. Um, the movement of, of people due to, for many reasons, because of the unfortunate situation of the jo- uh, placing of the, jo- uh, the geography and the um, moving of silt, but also because of the dam, the man-made dams and the changing of the, of the flow of the water and then the proven increase in severity of weather systems causing its severe cyclones such as Cyclone Isla which had happened before I, let, I arrived, I went and um, you know people living in places that had once been covered in forest and were now just open, silty spaces without a tree and no fish to catch. Um, And I visited places in India where the government had been trying to build sea sea walls Mm -hmm. um, uh, to, you know, stop the sea level rise and to act as a barrier to the the weather and the sea, sea level rise. Um, and they'd built these walls and you could see, as far as you could see out, you'd see a wall that had been um, eroded away by the, the, the force of the ocean. And then they'd try to build another wall and another wall. And then you'd see a house like in between the two walls and you could just see how the, the sea was encroaching on the land. But what was amazing was that you could travel maybe five miles along the coast and you'd see a community that had tried to, or had worked so hard to replant their mangroves. Mm-hmm. And they'd be living in this green mangrove forest with smiles on their faces, with food, with bird life, fish to catch. And it just goes to show that actually, if you could work, if you can work with nature and you know, we can flourish together. Hmm. That's incredible that it could be so different. So close. Yeah. And so does does that sort of lead to that there's more that we can do? There's a lot more than we can do that we're do than we're doing? Yeah, I mean there's so much that we can do. I mean at the moment I'm completely focused a lot of my work is back focused on plastic pollution. And it's quite in the weeds of plastic pollution <laughs> and how you shift these whole, you know, you shift these complex supply chains to reduce the use of particularly single use packaging. But, you know, last, we're working on this quite complex theory at the moment to <laughs> analyse how much plastic is going into the ocean and all of these different solution like interventions that are required across the whole value chain of plastic pollution such as you know reducing the use optimizing recycling developing new materials more effective litter capture cleanup of the ocean but actually you know if we're to be very straightforward about it then we all know we should just 
you know, this is an easy problem. Plastic pollution is an easy problem for us to solve in relative, in relationship to coral, ble coral bleaching, for example. Because, you know, first of all, we just need to get rid of all of the single-use packaging. And it was, you know, created in, since our grandparents were born. And we sit in these intense day-long meetings <laughs> talking about all of these various strategies we can do to reduce plastic pollution when actually a radical reduction of pla plastic packaging is something that we can do pretty easily. Um, yeah, but I mean, there's lots that we can do, isn't there? How, how easy do you think it is to do and what do you think it is that stops that from happening? <laughs> well, I mean, tomorrow I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got 35 business leaders who are coming to Bristol for a workshop on how to reduce plastic packaging. And I can say that in that meeting it's going to be very complicated because when you think about the reality of the supply chain, chain shift, you know, how do you... Um, you know, we're all so reliant on this food on the go culture yeah. and packaged food delivered to our house or from the supermarket. You want to have something that doesn't grow in your season and you want it to be shipped to you and <laughs> you want it to last in your fridge for a long time. And how you, you know, the complexities of shifting that supply chain from the types of you know, plastics we use to package our food to encouraging people to be more conscious about the food that they want to eat and how they want to purchase their food is very complicated. Mm -hmm. but sometimes I wonder whether it has to be. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. when you talked about like, you know, being in an all day meeting and then I can kind of imagine <laughs> then at lunchtime, everyone goes <laughs> and gets like, you know, something to eat. You're prepped salad because you're so busy. <laughs> right, exactly. And that there aren't many places that you can go these days where you, no. you get food on a plate. Like in a lot of the places it is all in plastic. And so no. we get kind of caught in these loops. Yeah, and I'm caught in this loop at the moment. I'm doing so much travelling to go to these meetings about saving the seas, burning up so much carbon energy and personal energy. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, oh, I must have my oat milk flat white. So now I carry around my keep cup, mm -hmm. which invariably leaks all over my bag. So my passport's got <laughs> <laughs> some cold, like, foamed of... Because <laughs> you drink it and you still get the foam, don't you, in the bottom of the keep mm -hmm. cup. And then <laughs> over the course of the day, it leaks in your bag. So you have that. Then you, so ha you need a... Um... <laughs> Uh, a kind of hardcore bag to put it in that's not single-use plastic but something yeah. else so you can keep it and you're going contained. into some fancy boardroom and I've got my bag with like my jam jar which had my yogurt in my spoon my keep cup my water container and then trying to take something for lunch so I don't need it's like clinking around <laughs> all a bit kind of desperately stinky by the time you get back to Bristol from a day in London. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not really a solution for everybody, I don't think. Yeah, it's funny that it's so hard still to do some of those things. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, I think also we're quite privileged because... I mean, a lot of the plastic problem is based, is stems from um, our economy and American economy, European economy, where, you know, <clears throat> we've developed this trend for fast life culture. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I feel that, you know, we have this responsibility within our communities to innovate to new systems and products and packaging um, which that you know that then can then spread across the world but then you know 
they say like over 70% of the plastic that's going into the ocean is coming from these 10 rivers, uh, which are predominantly in Southeast, Southeast Asia. And you know, people there have, have more pressing concerns around how to feed their family one meal a day. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, the fact that they haven't got their crops aren't growing. Or so it's it's a on this on the scale of priority in these people's lives. You know, collecting their waste and managing their waste is is probably low down. Hmm. Okay, so what can what can we do? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's um, it's it's also been quite interesting as we've just started this new program six months ago on very deep dive into into plastics. There's um, there's quite a few observations. First of all, I felt like the solutions are all there, so we should just get on with it. But actually, the science is, <clears throat> and our understanding of the problem is, is just beginning. Um, so we do need to understand the problem a little more to be able to really uh, shape the solutions and also evaluate how effective interventions are. Um, as far as industry we need to reduce the diversity of plastic types that we use so at the moment we have so many different ingredients in our plastic that's packaging our food and especially single-use plastic um, so so yeah to start actually to start again we we need to identify a group of plastics like the coffee cup the bag the plastic drink water bottle um, the balloons, the straws, the stirrers, <laughs> all of those, we just need to say, right, actually, we're going to regulate and not use them. And we're going to commit to not, not using these unnecessary plastics. And we as in? Businesses, as, okay. as in the global community. Like yeah. our grandparents lived without them. We have a crisis. Yeah, we need to make a commitment to our future generations that we stop using these what I would call unnecessary plastics um, and then the ones that the plastic types that are remaining they need to they should be made from like what there should be one plastic type because then if there is one plastic type it could be collected in a single stream and then it could be recycled and reused and it could enter what we call like a circular economy Mm -hmm. Um, and we would harness greater value in the plastic because it could go round and round the system four, five, six times. Um, So I think that that's where we need to go here in 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 Europe and and in America. In the rising economies, we need to support informal waste collectors to be formalised and enhance the value in the waste that they're creating. Um, the waste that they're collecting. The correct, collecting, yeah. sorry, yeah. Um, there's probably a need for some short-term landfill whilst we do that. And again, to regulate against all of the unva- very unvaluable plastic, like the films and the sachets, provide new systems for the sachets. The sachets? You know how when you're, well, you'll see it a lot in, in when you're travelling in India and you go, a, a lot of um, shops sell these kind of single serving of personal care products. Oh, like a shampoo, like shampoo or, something, yeah. or something. Which is... Uh, often thought of as like as a pro poor because people can afford like a single sa- serving more than a bottle, mm-hmm. but actually, the 
um, the brand makes a lot more money on a, on the selling the, the single sachet. sachet. Yeah. So, I mean, wouldn't it be fantastic if the brands kind of decided that they'd realise the same value in a sachet, you know, for the same volume of content in the sachet as they do in the bigger serving and use that the profit that they make to develop a new model mm-hmm. to provide single servings or smaller servings to um, people that can't afford the, the, the larger bottle but provide it without packaging. And those sachets are predominantly those, ending up in the ocean. Those sachets are um, the bigger, I, I would say, one of the biggest problems in, in rising economies the sachets and the films because the PET like our plastic drinks bottle and solid clear plastic like that is quite valuable so it does get collected mm-hmm. um, but this you know these films and these you know kind of what do you like what's films? like on top of my strawberry punnet of strawberries here this mm-hmm. this has got no got no value and Actually, interestingly, this says it's biodegradable, which is very, very interesting because it's only going to be biodegradable in a industrial composting facility. Huh. That, that is interesting. So mm. most people will buy that and think... I put it in my backyard compost. And nothing will happen. No. Not for a long time. Not for a long, <laughs> a long time. And that, so then there's this other interesting discussion going on around new materials and should we invest in in new materials as a solution for ocean plastics Mm -hmm. and I think that new materials has a role to play but if you don't you know no material should end up in the ocean should Mm -hmm. it so if you're going to invest in a new in a, a, a biodegradable material you still need to change you know, work with people to change their understanding of what they do with this material after they've used it. And then in concept to developing the new material, you need to develop the waste management infrastructure, which is going to be like a composting. Otherwise, this new material is just still going to leak in the sea. And, you know, there's no, there's no material that we know of that's in development that gets into the sea and suddenly starts being regenerative and feeding fish and having a mm-hmm. positive impact. At the moment, we don't know if that material, and hopefully one day it will exist, but still. And with all the brain power and the science and technology we have, we think we could create that material. I think it's not going to come to market for a few years, and meanwhile, we're still pouring this plastic into the ocean. So... I think people, I think we need to work on it, um, but primarily we need to reduce the amount of waste that we're creating as a society. Mm-hmm. And so this plastic, does any, it's there forever, like all of it? Or some plastics will biodegrade in a certain, in like a long time? Well, it doesn't biodegrade, it like photodegrades, so the sun Mm -hmm. and the sea like break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. So then, so it acts, so it's still in the environment. Any, as far as we know, any plastic, all plastic that's been created is still in some form in our environment. And how much plastic do we estimate we've created? Um, I think we produce about 311 million tonnes of plastic a year. So then what happens, it's like in these fine dust particles and it acts as a sponge for, um, it soaks up persistent organic pollutants, so like flame retardants and pesticides, fertilisers. So when it's in the water, it's and it's broken down, its surface area becomes bigger Mm -hmm. and it acts as a sponge for these toxins that are around the, that are in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and then these filter feeders come along and with their mouth open, ingesting everything, hopefully plankton. Uh, but actually they ingest these plastic particles. And then, you know, these filter feeders are at the bottom of the food chain. So if you imagine when you get to like a, a swordfish or a, something right at the top of the food chain, they've eaten so many small little fish with plastic particles in their stomach that they then, you know, they're, they're then um, full of plastic in their tummies, but also uh, you know, have, this, have this toxicity stored in their tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the fish that are at the top of the food chain that we're more likely to eat and there's quite an emerging body of science at the moment that say that <clears throat> there's say that there's plastic particles in the food that we eat and we know that there is in like we found it in um, many mussels around the coast and the bilarves the shellfish around the coast of England and then <clears throat> so we're then eating that and then that's getting into our food um, and our, in, into our system. And I've been doing quite a bit of research recently around how plastic particles can get and plastic waste can get into our and system and, our, and impact our human health. Um, and, and it can happen in several ways through like the lipsticks that you wear and the fish or seafood that you eat, possibly through the air that we breathe, like tire dust. And why lipsticks? Because, because of the plastic that it's in. Yeah, and no, because they have like micro particles of plastic in there. If you were to melt a lipstick down, some, <clears throat> then a kind of mainstream brand lipstick that's that's toxic that has some of the big five chemicals in it. Yeah. It has plastic in it. Yeah. Mm. So a lot of people, men and women, because of the kissing, it's... <laughs> because of the kissing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have a lot of... I'm sure that we have plastic in our system, aren't you? Yeah. I mean, I, I wonder how much it depends on lifestyle or if, we're, if there's no escaping it. Mm, I think that if you're living in, like, a burning plastic landfill living around a burning tip, then you've probably got more plastic in your lungs. Mm -hmm. But then the UK government's just doing some research into plastic from tire dust <clears throat> and whether that's in our part of our air pollution and how that impacts our from lungs. tire dust? Yeah, because the tires break down mm -hmm. and that's plastic, so... And then that's kind of evaporating into our air. Yeah. And we don't know whether those particles, because they're very, very small micro particles, um, we don't know whether they, well, we're looking into it at the moment, but we don't know whether they act kind of in a similar way to asbestos. Because mm -hmm. we don't really know like the structure of the particle and how it might or might not lodge in our in a lung or travel through our intestine wall, but we did, um, recently there was a scientific paper out that, um, that uh, stated that plastic particles had gone through the blood-brain barrier of fish. <laughs> so we think they travel through our intestine and, and then into, into our, you know, could be into our vital organs. But the science is pretty poor right now. And then, also, so I think I would be pretty confident, like we are very confident that plastic is going through our body, makes mm -hmm. sense. But then what we don't know is how, is what effect that has on our body. And it kind of makes sense to think of like these persistent particles of plastic that we know are in the marine environment. And like you just said, they never disappear. So if you imagine that they enter in our body and then it's like you get this autoimmune cell come along, go, oi, get out, this is my space. <laughs> and then it can't attack it because it's plastic, so it's persistent. Mm -hmm. So then another 
autoimmune cell comes along and tries and another and another. And before you know it, you've got an inflammation, haven't you? So is a big question I have is, is plastic a source of you know, chronic inflammation, which is, you know, you and I both know people a very close friend of ours that has chronic inflammation and testing issues and Mm -hmm. you have asthma issues and so does it contribute to that and also just in the marine environment as I was saying that the toxicity of the particle builds as it acts as a sponge for these other toxins that are in the marine environment when the plastic particle gets into your body is it then attracting other toxins and acting as a vector for other toxins as it travels through our body and we don't we don't know them uh, so I think the human health aspects of plastic waste is very interesting wow so we're not sea creatures now now we're like plastic creatures oh, no. <laughs> right let's go back to <laughs> sea creatures <laughs> no but it's important isn't it that to recognize and to be honest about the fact that this is happening and that we have no idea what the real health implications on society are going to be from this. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, even just as, you know, as as we know, you know, when you're living in certain climates, you don't really want vessels storing water because they attract malaria, or mosquitoes and malaria. Like plastic is a, you know, is a vessel that stores plastic waste, stores a lot of water. So... It's impacting our health through that, um, through acting as a vector for disease and pathogens, through simply blocking up storm drain systems and causing horrendous flooding, you know, mm-hmm. in community. Yeah, so it is already acting, and unfortunately, as a population, we we don't take the. Pre- precautionary principle do we we've got to prove everything to the nth degree and understand how the economics of solutions weigh up (laughs) rather than just saying and see enough people suffer and enough species suffer before we go actually yeah and and we and you we've all seen the images of um the whales and their insides and the path like yeah yeah we know that this is happening yeah I mean, this is the thing about plastic. It's like a gateway topic. I mean, it's quite amazing the the um, focus on plastic pollution as an environmental. Because suddenly we're able to talk about these complex, invisible, wicked challenges through a, a material that's around us all the time and very visible in nature. Mm-hmm. So just just as a kind of way of leaving us with a real clear set of what we can do, like how we can be, you know, ocean activists in our daily lives. Can you run us through just, it's amazing all the stuff that you're doing with industry and with business and that all these conversations are happening, but for our friends listening, what is it that they can start doing like literally when they finish listening to this um, in their lives? So, obviously having their keep cup and <laughs> learning from um, us and putting it in some kind of, you know, decent pouch. So it Cleaning it. <laughs> or just rinsing it out and yeah. you use it. It's not a design fault. <laughs> it's about how you use it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's your keep cup. There's obviously using your tote bags and not using your plastic bags. Um, trying not to buy anything that's in single-use plastic and and so whether that's going to markets for your fruit and vegetables um, and things like that rather than getting the, the pre-packaged ones in the supermarkets in the plastic in the single-use plastic um, mm. a wooden toothbrush a wooden toothbrush metal straws metal or glass or straws paper, yeah or paper straws but I think taking it, on, taking it all on at once is, might be a challenge. And then you might end up, you know, feeling like you do when you miss your morning meditation or yoga session. <laughs> that you, you know, causing more self-harm than self-good. So maybe I would suggest starting 
with like a couple of products and saying like now I will not buy a coffee in a single use coffee cup if it's mm -hmm. I don't need a coffee that much so I've got my keep cup if I forget it then I don't have a coffee and I've made that commitment to myself and and then like the str I mean it's easier for me because I'm so acutely aware of all the problems but the str mm -hmm. these things like straws and water bottles I mean you've got to be careful I think normally you can get a glass of water but you need to be careful you don't end up with a raging headache at the end of the day because you've mm -hmm. committed to not buying your water which happens to me now and again um but yeah so you, having a, a water bottle that you that yeah you carry so around having a you, coffee cup use. if you want to drink coffee having a water bottle and then trying to to not buy your lunch out and trying to sit a bit more inside cafes to eat. Ones that and, actually have plates and, plates. and metal cutlery. Yeah. And, and maybe taking just a little bit longer exactly. with your lunch. Having, having a good conversation. <laughs> but I think, and then, so there's all these single use products that we can stop using. The coffee cup, there's coffee, the um, like coffee stirrers, drink straws, drink stirrers, bags plastic cups plastic cups um, tea bags that are made of plastic bin bags like the lining Let's of your talk bin about the tea bags that are made of plastic mhm mm cuz that's like a lot of tea bags that <laughs> people would not think have plastic in them yeah it was like when we first realized that our shower gels had plastic in it, it was pretty gutting with the micro beads yeah. <laughs> yeah but we're getting rid of those now so that's a success yeah but then i would say you know, one of the best things that you could do is schedule time to go and camp on a beach and be by the sea and take friends and family and no with plastic. you and no plastic and just go and experience the beach and maybe do a bit of a beach clean up and then notice what you see there and try and commit to not using it in your own personal life and, you know, be an activist that way. Mm -hmm. And what about organizations and campaigns that um that people that want to get a bit more involved in this issue where can they go um in the uk then i would recommend going to surface against sewage and they are now really single issue organization that have doing some fantastic campaigning to westminster but also have guidelines for how to support your community to be single-use plastic free mm -hmm. um, and they're an organization that stemmed from their soul in the water in the salty water and fantastic leadership so surface against sewage <laughs> that's the one that that's like the main one that you'd recommend checking out and getting yeah involved I think so in. yeah I yeah. mean there's lots of organizations out there but if you want to be supported like, to support your community to become single-use plastic free then they have good really good guidelines. Amazing. And can you share with us a, a profound memory or just a moment of being at sea or being in the sea and, and what it is that made you fall in love with the sea so much? You take us into the sea with you. <laughs> um, I mean, one that just comes to mind now is when I was racing with Alexia, this uh, double-handed, and we were the only female team in this race from France to Brazil. And um, we came out, we were in a 40-foot boat, and then they, there's another 60-foot boat, and they're obviously faster, but we came out of the English Channel first, and we were like, so over the moon. And then the winds and built, and we had our big spinnaker up, and we literally sat on the helm with this big spinnaker for hours I think like 32 hours the two of us trying to sail this boat and keeping our first position even though we had about 25 days ahead of us <laughs> on this race and um yeah and just had all of a sudden the wind built so much that we couldn't get this big spinnaker down and the battle that the two two of us had to get this big sail down in this huge huge waves and building wind it's always a memory that I look back on with kind of admiration for Alexia and I who then spent you know another 29 days at sea together 
and also a, a respect for kind of, you know, it's see the so many times when you realise you've got to act now at what Mother Nature is throwing at you and you can't wait to the future because your life might <laughs> be at risk because the wind might build too much and then, you know, you're going to get in serious trouble. And that time we definitely left it too late. So it's a good memory to keep with us, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, act now before we leave it too late and then we get into more trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can't just, I'll just watch a movie and then I'll yeah. have uh, a glass of wine and then I'll, ha do, I'll do something about this. It's no. like immediate. However much fun it was surfing down those huge waves in that building weather. <laughs> we should have changed that sail a lot earlier. We probably wouldn't have ended up in such a mess. <laughs> then there's the kind of, you know, the, the calm of being at sea and uh, the rhythm of multiple week trip and the watch system and the incredible canopy of stars in the, in the night sky. Mm. And what's it like to be like so far out at sea that there's, you can't, you can't see land and you know that you can't get to land for, well, for, for such me. a long time? For me, it's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> it's like, oh, no emails, no complex decision making. <laughs> Just keep these people alive, keep this boat going forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. Make sure you read the weather quite well, but if you don't, there's not much you can do about it because it's not going to change that quickly. <laughs> so, well, you're not going to be able to change the position of your boat against the weather systems that quickly. It's a very simple life, and I think... Um, uh, yeah, life on land can be extremely confusing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And have you ever been out in the middle of the sea by yourself? Or are you always with other people? Yeah, I have been out in the... I've never crossed the Atlantic on my own, which is something that I did set off to do, actually. And then, because um, I really wanted to do a mini transat, which is a 21-foot surf boat that they sail single-handedly across the Atlantic. And I did a lot of the training, but then was actually quite fortunate that my... I found a sponsor who wanted me to, who preferred for us to race a bigger boat, mm -hmm. which was the two-handed racing that I did with Alexia. So I never did it, but sometimes at the moment I'm, I'm actually looking at the minis that are on the market to see if I could afford one and just go off and do it. Uh, but yeah, I have, I've spent short periods of time at sea, but never an ocean crossing. Mm -hmm. Does it, do you feel like you're on your own or do you feel do yes, you, you feel like you're on your own, yeah. Do you feel, do you feel the aliveness of what, what you know is underneath? Yeah, it's, I mean, the thing is, a lot of the, the two-handed sailing, because you're, you're always, because you run the boat for 24 hours a day, so you're nearly always on deck on your own, because mm. you sleep. Like, you, you helm for like an hour and a half, and then you sleep for an hour and a half, and you swap. Um, so you spend, I've spent a lot of time on my own while someone else has been asleep. <laughs> yeah. Now you're making me just want to go back to sea. <laughs> <laughs> but where are you going? The office. The office. <laughs> my laptop. At the moment, I'm like, oh my goodness. So many documents to read and meetings to travel to. I sometimes wonder whether the balance is quite right. But if it means that you know, the next generation gets to enjoy the ocean in the way that you have, it's worth it. Yeah, let's hope so. Oh, it's been nice to be taken out of my very geeky report writing and meeting facilitations and da-da-da to think about going to sea. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jo. So how do we find you? It's commonseas.com. Yeah, so I run now a small a social business. We're a not-for-profit social business called Common Seas. And, uh, yeah, commonseas.com. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening. As always, you can find links to everything we mention in this episode, download our book, and discover so much more over on the blog. We don't believe in selling you things you don't need through this podcast. And so it's made possible by you, our community. 
If you loved this and would like to contribute to our Patreon campaign or join our online group to connect with other listeners, please visit www.thefutureisbeautiful.co and click on community. Please also hit subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes so we can grow. Here is to us, creating a beautiful future together.